California is a strong brand, the place of dreams, movie stars and new beginnings, with a heavenly climate. But the Golden State is running out of money, and so is the city of Los Angeles. Public services are being cut, unemployment is rising, and many people have lost their homes in the economic crisis. But optimism and the belief in the power of America seem unaffected. Who are the pioneers of the new America in the making? And how do they see the future? Any donations? I'd like to donate? Any donations? To the firefighters of Los Angeles County? You know, I'd like to donate, sir. Any change, quarters, anything else, sir? Any donations, ma'am, to the firefighters of Los Angeles County Fire Department? Any loose change, quarters, anything else, ma'am? The fire department needs money? Any yes, ma'am. We're suffering through the massive budget cuts. L.A. County, L.A. City, basically anywhere in California. All money's welcome! There's lack of equipment, we're cutting back. I mean, would you like to have a house burning and nobody come and save you? Yeah, it wouldn't be too good. I'd like to donate any donations. We faced a, a huge deficit this year in, in the city. At, at one point, close to a half a billion dollars deficit in the, the upcoming year. Uh, what we've had to do is uh, reduce uh, many of the services potentially that we'd have, look at how we get back to the core services what a municipality is supposed to provide. We were almost um, potentially going to get down to zero on a reserve fund. What that, what that means is if we had any kind of emergency, uh, we had some natural disaster, which unfortunately Los Angeles often has had, an earthquake, uh, fires, um, we wouldn't have the cash to be able to respond. And this is a, a crisis that we're facing in this country and, and the state and the city, and that we, we don't want to become a, a third world uh, country. We can be eternally optimistic, uh, but if your optimism is blinding you to necessarily some of the problems that you face, um, it just, it's going to be a revolving door and a cycle that we can't get out of. LA was a huge hotbed in regards to the whole subprime bars. It's been a very large amount of people that have been, millions of people I would say, that have been affected by this. So as you can see, there are a lot of people here asking for assistance. And these fairs are something that are going on on a monthly basis within the alley area, so there is still a tremendous need out there. Where do people go after they are thrown out of their house? Where many people go, either they move in with family or they just try to look for somewhere to go rent. So a lot of things where you've seen is that people have been moving in, you have maybe two or three families living in one unit, because a lot of people have either, maybe some of these people haven't lost their homes, but they, they've lost their jobs. So we're seeing a lot of kids coming back home to their parents' home, or we're seeing families combine, because the situation is very difficult right now. I think Oak Park has always been one of my favorites, and I think that's why we started going over there once we realized we could legally park there, because for me, like, that's where I grew up, so it feels very, like, home to me. I feel comfortable there. I just love it. I love all the big oak trees. It just makes me feel like my childhood, and it's so peaceful. Hey, baby. Do you want hamburgers, Justin, or no. do you want hot dogs? Hot dogs. Yeah, I think the kids would prefer hot dogs. No. Watch out, Justin. You can't come over here, son. It's going to get really hot soon. <laughs> what did you doing, Tay Tay? Hi. Hi. Where'd you track go? Where'd you play? I was working at a hotel as a reservations agent. It was a really good job and I loved it. In school we learned that California is, I think it was the seventh uh, largest economy in the world, not just the country of America, but just the state of California. When I started working, it was so easy to find jobs. I mean, I'd walk in somewhere, hey, are you hiring? Like, and they'd have work for you to do. Like, it was no problem at all. And since I've been back, it's incredible to me how much the town has changed, how much, uh, how many more people are in their cars, how many more people are on the streets, how many more businesses are closed down, you know, empty storefronts, and it's just sad. You guys ready to eat? Taylor! Before we actually, uh, we were living here in Santa Barbara in a two-bedroom apartment. 
for a year and a half. And then how, how long did it take? I mean, you both lost your job? It was, it was so fast. It was, I lost my job and two weeks later she lost her job. And then? And then it was probably two weeks after that we were in, in a uh, motel. I mean, it was, it was fast. I'm an electrician and when all the, the housing market crashed, um, work got really, really hard to find. And it just hasn't really gotten any better since. Well, they give us food stamps. You can only buy food with it. And I think they give us 600 a month for that. So that's actually quite a bit of food. It's pretty much the only thing we have is we have a lot of food, but not many places that cook it. So yeah. this is the only place that I've found so far that we can cook actual food. Our refrigerator and our RV doesn't work. Our heater doesn't work. Our burners don't work. Taylor, I said stay inside. Justin, come on. Uh, come on. Cool. Well, that's good, honey, but we're not going to come back and play here. We're going to go over to the parking lot. Yeah. You want some chips? Mom? Yeah? That mom is high me. Yeah. Okay. Nice, right? No. Well, it's either dinner or bed, Taylor. No. You still got to eat. As soon as we started thinking about the idea of buying an RV with the last of our money and everything, we started looking for where we could park and we started noticing there's just a ton of RVs in this town and they're on the streets and when you go by at two in the morning they all have their generators running. Clearly people are living in them. They're not like there for when people are on vacation like you might think. People are living in them and I didn't realize how many people until we started doing this. especially for families or people with children who are living out of their car. Um, Santa Barbara has this great program, the Safe Parking Program, where they provide people with a parking space like this where it's off the road, where we're not going to get harassed by people, probably won't get broken into. Um, we won't get harassed by police or, or ticketed or towed or anything like that. We're totally safe sleeping here. So that's basically the program. I mean, it has its limitations. Of course, it's only here during the nighttime, but it's a good program. So we can come here anytime after 7 p.m., but then we have to be gone by 7 a.m. You're angry at somebody for ending up in this situation? Oh, no. Um, what can you do? I mean, he lost his job and then I lost my job. Like, I'm a little mad at us for not having more of a savings, but we never, I mean, we tried, and that was kind of all we could scrounge together by the time this happened to us. But. Um, I mean, everybody's hurting for jobs. My employers were so kind to me when they let me go. They were so nice. They felt so bad, but they just had to do it. And his had to, too. So I can't be mad at anybody. I just, you know, we just are trying to find work. You know, if either one of us can get a job, then we should be a lot better off. Well, the class divisions are getting so much further. You know, it used to be that you really could be born with nothing here and like work your way up the ladder. And I've been reading so much on the middle ladder rungs are just like not there anymore. There's just becoming more and more of a divide. And we know in history that it's never good for countries when there's that much of a divide between the people with money and the people, you know, and the people without are doing really, you know, the worst that the people without money do, 
the angrier they're going to become, the more desperate they're going to become. You know, there just becomes more robberies, more crime. You know, eventually, I mean, in history, eventually they would just rise up. Or so, I mean, it would, you know, it, it could be very problematic if that continues, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Justin, Christine? It's Roz from New Beginning Safe Parking Program. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. I saw you parked down here and thought I'd come and check on you okay. and see what I could do. There are a lot of people who are losing their homes. You can see all the for lease, for sale, for rent signs everywhere. Uh, it wasn't like this a few years ago. Some people are very depressed. I mean, it's depressing to lose your job and your home and maybe some of your possessions. Um, you know, it's a very degrading thing uh, for people to go through when they start losing all the things that they knew and had worked hard for. Candace, hi! How are you, darling? Are you still over at Casa Esperanza? No? This is Jess and he and his two sons, who are 14 and 15, live on the bus and they've been in our program about four years. How are you doing? I'm oh, doing good. I'm <laughs> good. Yeah, you need anything? Uh, yeah, six tires. Yeah, six new tires for the <laughs> boss, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you need to get that money Take together. I talked to my boss and he really? doesn't have any cash. Uh, yeah, that's got... always his story. Well, no, it's true. I mean, we didn't get very much this year from the city or from any of the people who usually donate. Yeah. So things have been pretty bad. Yeah, well, food bank day is Thursday, so I'll come by and see you on Thursday after the food bank in the afternoon okay. and drop off some food and stuff. How did you end up in these books? Uh, the dot-com bubble, and I lost uh, my houses and everything eventually, and uh, this is what we had left to live in. What were you doing? Software engineering. Sorry? Software engineering. And then you were fired? <laughs> no, then my company went out of business. I was the CEO of a major dot-com. Well, Professor, it looks like there's a show today. Uh, <laughs> testing. We're having a problem, though. I don't know if this microphone's working yet. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mother Teresa of social work in California. <laughs> if you can say glockenspiel without uh, smiling, Don Bardo, what do they get? <laughs> he worked for CBS News. He was Dan Rather's film editor and worked for CBS LA. You look familiar. Which parking lot are you at? Did you want to see my box? Yeah. Ah, oh, you're all ready to do collections for food and everything, huh? I tried it once, it didn't work. Do you guys have spare change? Uh-huh. You do? I don't have anything oh, on yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't have a thing. All right, on. Peace and love. Power, power. <laughs> That's from the 60s. You don't feel that the city government should be taking care of these people? Well, uh, the city government and this city and many cities across the country and especially in the state of California uh, is in the red right now uh, to the tune of several millions of dollars. And so I uh, don't think it's up to the government. And I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg here in California. There's going to be less and less money. So it's going to take more people being creative, thinking outside of the box and doing something to be a part of the solution instead of the problem. Dogs around today. Yeah, dog. Yeah. I was working at um, a hotel. I was working at this hotel here, the Fest Parker's Double Tree. <laughs> yeah, it's a little embarrassing to now be like parked across the street in my RV. <laughs> I always hope I don't see some of the people that I used to work with running around the lawn. Did you ever? I haven't. No, luckily. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You like to say hi. Yeah. Where are we going, TJ? What's your biggest fear? That the kids will um, 
eventually, you know, that we'll still be doing this when the kids are old enough to realize the situation we're in, that it'll somehow embarrass them at school. That's my fear, is that it'll embarrass them, that they'll be embarrassed or they'll be ashamed of their parents or their home. That makes me cry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't like to look at, at life like fears. I, uh, I like to look at it as just challenges. So my, my biggest challenge is to get us back out of this situation. I'm in Jobs Club, which um, you know I go every morning, uh, 8.30 in the morning I have to be there. I'm usually there for about an hour, an hour and a half. They teach you how to do resumes and how to talk to an employee. They videotape you so you can see what you look like when you're doing a resume. Excuse me, coming through, guys. Coming through. Thank you. I feel frustrated just because I feel like I'm letting my own family down. You know, I'm supposed to be the, the person that's taking care of them. There's so many jobs out there that we don't get opportunity to have. Um, in, this, in this state, I can't even be a cook. I used to be a cook when I was in high school. And if you don't speak Spanish, you don't get to be a cook. The immigration problem, I think, is one of the largest problems to our, to California. And California's upset, right? You have to go back to the way it's supposed to be, is hiring your own citizens for a proper wage, instead of having these citizens that are coming from a different country and working for half that wage. How often do you come here looking for jobs? Every day. Yeah. Every day. What do you look at? Uh, usually Craigslist, Monster.com, um, just any uh, job ads on the internet, anywhere I can find jobs. A lot of putting out uh, resumes and filling applications and no returns. It's a handbook for job search. I think that if you've actually maybe graduated high school or had a couple jobs, this stuff would be pretty repetitive and kind of insult you and your intelligence in a way that they wouldn't have. Now, they got a teacher there to teach you stuff, but they're not really teaching the normal person anything that's going to help them in the real day getting a job. It says you have to bathe and shower prior to an interview, wear clothing that is clean, pressed, and well fitted, wear appropriate clothing and footwear, make sure your hair is clean and combed, hands are clean, brush your teeth, freshen your breath, no gum. Wear supple perfume and cologne, if any. Tattoos, you have to cover them if you can. I rarely get to take a shower as it is right now, or my suit is there, but it's not pressed. You know, I, my polished shoes probably aren't the most polished, but you know, you do what you can, and that's just the hard with the job market. Jesus. Let's do a driving <laughs> lesson. <laughs> that is so funny. Well, here's the thing is, is that we're getting in our car to drive two blocks. Like if <laughs> This is Los Angeles because we could have walked two blocks, no, no, but no, the, the weird we're going to take two cars to go a few blocks. hundred meters. Yeah. It's less than a hundred meters. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> well, let's park here. Oh, 
some fruit. Yeah, how many got in the bag? I don't Public fridge. It's true. The crazy part is how delicious it is. It smells really good. Now that's talent. Woo. What we just did is pick public fruit from uh, the streets of Los Angeles in the, in, uh, in the neighborhood of Silver Lake. We all live in this neighborhood, and that's how we began. We just made a map of all the trees that were like this one. What's so great about this particular neighborhood is that these trees were planted a really long time ago by, uh, we don't know who, but the public, because there's no law about the sidewalks, about who owns the space, this is the city, and, and behind the walls is the people's property. So in this area, there's no law that says that you can't do this. And so in the city of LA, they say that it is not illegal to pick this fruit. People want locally produced, and nothing is more local than this, right? combined with a terrible economic situation. So, of course, it, it's going to change the way people live in the cities everywhere. No, it doesn't look right. No, it is good. <laughs> this is like, um, this, is, this tree's perfect for LA car, car culture, because all you have to do is drive by and stick out your hand, and then drive away. But I threw fertilizer on this tree um, a few weeks ago. You did? Yeah, I did. Thank you, Matias. Yeah. So the peach tree that we just picked, we call um, a drive-by fruit because you can you can uh, sit as you're driving and just pick fruit from the window of your car. Over here, you have a very different kind of public. Oh fruit. yeah, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> the fruit divine. vendor. <laughs> it's really yummy because they put like salt and cayenne pepper on them. People that I know that have lost their homes, they they are okay in a way. They do lose their house. They do lose the money and the time they put into their homes. But the people I know have changed. They've moved to other cities. They have moved in with family. They, there's a connectedness that wasn't there 10 years ago. We were very detached and people were more interested in objects. And now people are more interested in experience. Over there, that's uh, dragon fruit. Right there, those cactus. Really? Yeah. Bananas. Oh, these are the bananas. Are the yeah, bananas. yeah, yeah. Isn't that they're funny? just so little. They're flowers. Yeah. Yeah. These are the bananas. And the, the, here, see, they're coming. So yeah. So this is crazy because it'll it'll just keep going to the, to yeah. the sidewalk. This one's really good because it's so public. You know what's so cool about this place and these people is that these this is like the 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 epitome of you know like the generous. Citizen. Very generous. Yeah, he, he planted all this stuff so that he could share it with his oh, look, neighbors. An avocado yeah, too. he planted an avocado. Incredible. Yeah. Do you guys share all your fruit? We do. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. It's... Have you ever had the grapefruits from around the corner on Marathon? No, we haven't really done too much foraging around the neighborhood. Do you just keep a local? Here we have uh, Meyer lemon and we have Eureka lemon. And we have bartender lime, and that's a navel orange. And in the back, we have uh, tangerine and blood orange. And on the other side of the yard, we have uh, tomatoes and tomatillos. Uh, we have broccoli, red cabbage, Brussels sprouts, artichokes. I think maybe one out of every three people doesn't have a job right now in Los Angeles. It's pretty close to that. What about you? Yeah, I lost my job last year, along with a bunch of my friends at the same time. The university system uh, let a lot of people go. You were teaching? Yeah, I taught in university for 16 years, since I was a kid. And uh, yeah, that time's over, I think. A lot of situations that happen in our lives that we, they seem insurmountable and, and, and we just, we get stuck in them or we just can't see beyond them. 
<coughs> so, so what I want to encourage everybody to do today is to think about not everything that is faced can be changed. That's true. Because there's certain things in life that we can't, right? But nothing can be changed until it is faced. So try it. Try to face it. Whatever it is, however small or large it is, try it and take little baby steps towards, towards facing whatever challenges, whatever demons, whatever we hold within ourselves. All right, that's the thought. Thank you. All of these are going to be for today? Yeah. This side, that side, and this too. Okay. These I added them because they hadn't confirmed, but then they confirmed. Do you have your weekend. files? Mm -mm. I don't so know who's going to come out, but I don't know who's going to be here. Okay. This guy's going to be here for sure. Rafi, Shahi, Shannon. So I'm going to get those out. Yeah. So you're going to be next. Thank okay? You. You're welcome. My face. Um, I got this the first time I went to jail. Um, this yeah. one, you earned this by killing somebody. Great you know? no, and then this one is for no. for love, Hello. love of the game, love of the game. You know? Why do you want to get them removed? The future, I don't want. You know, I don't want it to hold me back when I get a job. You know, and it makes people look at you differently, a lot differently, and I don't want that. I'm trying to change my life. She's worked up, so she's a little grouchy too. Um, I'm progress since I've been out. Good I mean, God you. has opened the doors in all different directions. Yeah. I don't hang on nobody. I go to work, come home, and that's it. Good for you. That's Congratulations. It. That's mm -hmm. a big deal. Did 14 years, his case got overturned. Stanford took his case. Yeah. Stanford Law School, you said? Stanford Law School. Don't they have that? There is that that group that does that? That specific? They look at these cases. I think and they so. Have yeah, that is for them. DNA and all. Well, the that's components. what they did for him. They did it for me. They took my case. Took them two years to get me in the courts. Wow. They did a declaration for my whole past. I've never been in trouble with violence. They proved all that to the courts. So yeah. how long were you in? Fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen years. years for something you didn't do. Well, I did it, but it, it doesn't cost 25 years of life oh, um, for you. radio, you for know. Radio. Oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. So the judge had told the DA, this man don't deserve 25 years of life for a radio. He's, he's a repeat offender, but for petty crimes and 25 years, I'm letting this man go. <laughs> wow. um, when I walked out of the county jail, um, out the back door, I walked up the street and walked back towards the county because society is differently. I'm still adjusting. I don't go out as much because it's dangerous out there in society. Um, I always look on my surroundings. And the buildings, the streets, um, surrounding people around me, um, the cars, the phones, the iPods, oh. everything's different. This is Gabby. What, happened? what are you working on? This, the block, this, that, this, that. So all, all the whole All of it. Okay, and we're doing and the all side this, too? that. It's going to be starting to fade already. Okay, and up here? And all this. Okay. Take your drop. You remember how it all works, right? Yeah. And how it feels? Yeah. Okay, you want a squeeze ball? Mm hmm. I got this tattoo and I was just a kid. And all the rest of it was done in prisons. At the time, I wanted to be a gangster at that time, you know? Started drinking at a really young age, doing, you know, I stayed wherever I could. I was homeless, uh, mostly downtown LA. I brought up in LA too, uh, in streets, parks, box. I had it hard. Okay. Sound all right? All right. All right, man. Good luck. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank Good you to very see much. you. Bye-bye. So I live at home with my mom and dad. I have my own room. I got my own gym in the backyard. I got weights. 
You know, I got my fix it all the way I wanted. My room looks like Circuit City. I got TVs and boom boxes and Walkmans and CD players and nice clothes and stuff. This is stuff that I never had. And I accomplished all this in a year. You know, it's luxury, but, and I worked for it too. When he was growing up, he was a good kid. And now I'm, I'm glad he's back on course again. And he paid for his mistakes, but he overpaid them for mistakes anyway. But thing is that now, but now he's ordered his 40s now, and he lost all his, all his youth being locked up. To me, it's, it's not fair at all. So somebody owes him, but he can't get his life back that he took from him. That's what's sad. When I was in prison, you know, they talked about the deficit and how people lost their houses and everything because of the crisis. I got lucky, I found a job. So I hold on to that job and I, you know, and I just like, you know, I try not, you know, yes sir, no sir, and do my job, you know. And they're on time. Actually, I'm supposed to be at work at three, I'm there about two, two fifteen, just sitting there and start work. I sit in my car and read my Bible and then, uh, I go in there and have me a little cup of noodle soup and start work. And I work 48 hours a week, six days a week. I make 300, almost 400 a week. And with that, I pay bills with it and I go pay the bills right away as soon as I get them. I never wait. I get them and I go pay the bills the next day. As soon as I get my check, I go pay bills. So I don't have to worry about anything like that here around here. This is all filled up with new stuff. Sweats, shirts, jeans, brand new jeans, socks, t-shirts, you know. You got a lot of stuff, huh? Yeah, I bought, yeah. Stuff that I never had, you know. And, and that's not it, there's more. All new stuff. You know, t-shirts and tank, tank tops and t-shirts and stuff like that. And when I see something, I'll buy it. Bank card. <laughs> Checking and bank card, so it's like, I don't have to worry no more, you know? It's like, I can buy it if I want it. You know, I don't have to rob or steal no more. I think the only certainty in today's day and age that is that things are going to be in a state of constant flux and uncertainty. So my own philosophy with, with raising my own children is that 
you know, the most important capacity is to be adaptive and to know how to learn. But the fact that, you know, these economic crises, this fact that, um, you know, jobs are moving between countries in a way that's completely unpredictable, uh, that we really don't know what the future holds in terms of the sort of opportunities that are out there. That, to me, seems like the one certainty that we have for today's kids. I work at the University of California, <laughs> so we have felt the economic crisis for sure. There's been uh, huge budget cuts. But this idea that the public university is going to be there as one of the finest educational institutions that supplies education at low cost, this model is coming under challenge as the University of California is facing these budget shortfalls, having to raise tuition, and uh, increasingly relying on private money for funding. For my own kids, I'm extremely hopeful because I think that for them, they're really able to take advantage of a lot of the opportunities that the new media environment has to offer. So much of this access to knowledge is happening in very private settings. If you have a family that doesn't have a computer, going to the school library for an hour every other day is not the same as having a smartphone always connected to the internet, uh, being able to be on MySpace and Facebook with your friend all the time. That gap is really huge, and the school is not really a context that can mediate that disparity anymore. These two computers are connected and, um, well, I can go to both at the same time and my mouse can connect between both. Luna, you prefer your real pets or your virtual pets? Um, my real pets. <laughs> yeah. Why? Well, because I can play with her however I want, but these big, these guys, um, they're only, well, I can only do what the computer programs them to do, so. I think what we're moving towards is towards digital technology becoming a very sort of pervasive part of everyday life so that we don't really think about the distinction between the real and virtual as something radically different. I think the worst case scenario is that these sort of technologies will accelerate the divide between the more privileged and less privileged. And I think a city like LA is a place where you might see that happening. So I think that is the worst case scenario. I think the best case scenario is that it will actually help bridge some of those divides. My name is Laura Burkhalter. I'm an architect, and I've been thinking about the urban paradigm my whole life because I believe that there is another way. My dream is that the city becomes a city for people 
instead of a city for cars and money and power, that the city is built by people for people. I envision infrastructure for people, for example, bicycle freeways where you could cross the city from one end to the other with a, without a single traffic light. I guess the crisis kind of helped us out. We had a baby on the way and we were looking to move into an apartment to rent and it was so expensive. We said, we can't afford it, you know. We started thinking, well, maybe now is the time to look at all the stuff that's foreclosed on and bank owned and no one wants it. So we were lucky to get this place for less than half of what it would have been two years before. And we get to share it with our friends, with our community and grow food. I think a lot of people are starting to turn on to the idea of growing their own food too, mm -hmm. because it's really probably better for you, obviously, than the things that you buy from the supermarket that are from out of the country <laughs> or grown with a lot of pesticides or something. Right. Thousands of and miles And it's really away. cost effective to it's grow them yourself. Yeah, it's much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people are also getting behind it right now, mm -hmm. because I read something, I forget, it's like a six time, you, you six fold your money. Oh, right. <laughs> like, let's say you buy a tomato plant for $3. The amount of tomatoes you get from it is like oh, yeah. six times more than what it would cost really? you to buy the tomatoes. Right. It is also making people aware that they can do it in their apartment because, you oh, know, yeah. not everyone is fortunate to I have know. like an amazing yeah. space like this. Yeah. And like, I'd love to be able to learn how to grow like little plants on my balcony or you know something like right. that i would do that i mean we have the space on my balcony and it's oh, yeah. it's absolutely mm -hmm. the case that produce is expensive now way more than it used to be for a variety Especially of reasons Especially being more conscious and doing and organic yeah. And yeah. eating well mm -hmm. is very expensive, it's, expensive. Mm -hmm. it's the i mean who can afford to go to whole foods <laughs> exactly this is what i'm saying no one. <laughs> i think after the crisis i think in anyone's mind, whether you're an entrepreneur or a person, a, a citizen of any nation state is, is how do you become um, empowered and self-sufficient? Because we have this crisis and people were dependent upon a system. And now I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people are, are lost and uh, trying to figure what happened and what's going on. I think the best uh, cure, I guess, or what I think uh, is action and how do you, uh, be self-sustainable, how do you empower yourself? I think the system has made us believe that we are powerless, that we're just at the mercy of the system, but we're not, because the system can only exist with us buying into the system, and if we don't, and we start creating our own reality, then the system can no longer exist that way. This is our workout for the day. <laughs> <laughs> what I think it takes to get anything done is first of all for people to start daring to imagine what would a cool city be like, what would it be like to live in a really awesome city, what would that look like? And then step two is to start taking some action. This is the door right here? No, that's the half round. This is the half round. So let's, maybe let's find out where the door is. Yeah, let's that's find the that door right, right here. This is the that door. looks rectangular, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's here. take it so this way, kind of toss it up. Toss it up, <laughs> okay. The sense of community is becoming much more important than it used to be. People depend on each other. They didn't used to depend at all. Everyone was like off to themselves and looking for their own interest. And now people need each other. This is a bedroom and Lauren will live here first. I think one of these, this one might be getting it off. Yeah. Which one is the long one? This one's longer for two. You don't have a bedroom now? That one's I do, but I'm moving out of the place so and then to be offered to live here i would definitely live here so 
Uh, one is super long. This one? This one you like? The long one? Or I grew up in a commune and we were very much on top of each other. And I think this one will take care of some of the issues that I think happen in the mo more typical commune um, setups. So I want to find out if it's possible to have a, you know, kind of a more modern version of how to live in a city communally. In the 70s, people, they felt like everyone has to follow one thing. If I'm a vegetarian, you all have to be vegetarians. If I don't drive a car, everyone has to not drive a car. It was more ideological. And now I think it's more practical in a way. You know about farming? I'm learning, learning as I go. It's just beautiful and so meditative. Just kind of go in my zone. <laughs> I think that gold rush is over, yes. Um, people don't have the possibility to go after it because there's no, nothing of value that you can just like flip and make quick cash. So that's the whole premise of gold rush. Is that the end of the American dream? No. I think the American dream is bigger than that. I think that's just one part of the American dream that's been the expression of the American dream in the past you know, couple decades but I don't think that's the whole American dream. I think the American dream has to do with uh, self-expression to freedom. And it's been caught up in this kind of want to have, you know, materialistic aspect of the American dream. But I think Americans are very optimistic people and they, uh, they will get back up. So I think the freedom is, now being redefined. And I think that's still the American dream is freedom. But maybe it's freedom from the system. Maybe it's, you know, having your own solar cells and your own power and not having to pay into the system and having ways to get around that's not part of the gasoline company's profit. It's another kind of freedom. One thing about Americans is that they're very flexible. I think it's gonna take longer for the rest of the world to accept the new identity for America than it is gonna be for Americans to accept the new identity. Because people change their lives all the time here. And that it's kind of the way it is. And oh, this is over. What's next, you know, let's start over.